Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions, and thank you again so much for our time together. What a beautiful pleasure to sit down with you. Today we've got some wonderful teaching, finishing up uh, Jeremiah, going through Hebrews chapter 6, an incredible passage. But let's get started today with Psalms chapter 91. I I keep sharing this with people, and there are many from other churches that I talk to, wonderful Christians who they haven't even thought of Psalms 91 in this passage. Share Psalms 91 with people, folks. That That is a foundation for safety and security, a good foundation of faith in these days. Psalms 91, 1-16 He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love. I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy and show him my salvation. As we go to prayer today, I want us to remember the churches, especially across Western Europe and here in the Metro Manila area. I've been getting text messages from pastors that are, it's it's been a hard year for them. And now France, Belgium, Germany, uh, Spain, the churches are locked down again. The whole place is going into lockdown again. And it's because of people going, at least in Germany, it's people going to birthday parties, they say without masks on. Now, they're very obedient every place else, but then they have to have their birthday parties and everybody eats and laughs in small rooms together and then you have a problem. So let's pray for them today. And let's pray now as Manila begins to reopen, that God will give our pastors faith, no fear, but prudence and discipline. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We thank you for all of your goodness and for all of your mercy. Father, we ask for these churches, Lord, across Western Europe. Father, it has been a hard season. It has been a hard year for them. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that your hand of blessing would rest upon all of these pastors, that you give them wisdom and how to continue to meet the needs of the people in this time, that they would continue to feed the flock and care for the flock and know the condition of the flock even during lockdown. Give them wisdom and how to minister in difficult times, Father. How to be shepherds in a time of lockdown. And Father, let the thing reopen again, that their churches can function. Father, I pray right now and I thank you. I thank you for Metro Manila beginning to open. Father, I pray for every pastor, not only for faith, but for wisdom and prudence to do things safely. Father, they won't take on any of these arrogant attitudes of faith, but they'll take on the rest of faith. And Father, they'll share prudence and share safety. And Father, we won't see churches becoming a problem. Churches won't be super spreader events. Let there be discipline in every church, Father. Father, your work will not be spoken badly of. Father, I pray for all the pastors. It has been a very difficult and a very lean year. 
Father, let them see the faithfulness of God and let them be encouraged by the faithfulness of the people. Lift their heads, Father. And Father, let your work begin to move forward stronger than ever before. Father, I lift to you all the frontliners again in the hospitals especially. Let your hand rest upon all those doctors. Let your hand rest upon all those nurses, all those med techs. Father, they live difficult lives right now. Long hours, hard work, and discouraging work. But Father, you are the lifter of their heads. You are the God of eternal encouragement. Lift them, Father. Encourage them, Father. And Lord, I pray for all the seniors today. Let there be no fear in their heart. No fear, Father. You have not given us a spirit of fear. Give us the wisdom and the discipline to walk in prudence. But Father, let there be no fear within our hearts as we come back out of our homes and go into the services. Let there be no fear in the hearts of the young people as they come out of their homes and begin to re-engage in life. But let there be wisdom and prudence. I thank you for it, Father. We lift to you all of our government officials today, Lord. They've got hard decisions to make, difficult decisions to make. Give them wisdom and understanding, Father. And give the hearts of the people understanding hearts with their leaders. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up our hearts now and spend some time in worship.
Our New Testament passage today is found in Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to pick up today with verse 4. For it is impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and that word there is rhema, and the powers of of the age to come. Now notice, five things, five characteristics of a person turned away. Now, he said, these are people who had repented before. These are Christians. And I know people say, once saved, always saved. And, you know, once you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can never turn back. But I want you to see Paul doesn't teach that. He said, it's impossible to restore again to repentance those who have once been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They've known salvation. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. They've received the Holy Spirit into their life. They've become the temple of the Holy Spirit. They've tasted the goodness of the rhema. They've heard the voice of God, not, not just the logos, reading the Bible. They've had the specific word of God spoken to them. Their spirit man has heard the word of God and the powers of the age to come. They've seen miracles. 
Now, there are people like this that if they, if they then fall away, if they then, and the emphasis is on the word then, if they then fall away, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Now, brothers and sisters, these are not people who simply wander away. These are people who have matured in God. I mean, please, these, these, are, not, these are not little baby Christians that just wander away because they don't know any better. These are people that, forgive me, these have been very committed Christians with a relationship with God. They've tasted the rhema. They've heard the voice of God. They've tasted the powers of the age to come. They've seen miracles. They've, they've experienced, they've tasted, not just seen, they've tasted, they've experienced for themselves miracles. And when they turn away, they crucify again the Son of God. They're not just wandering away out of lack of knowledge. They've made a conscious decision. He said they're crucifying again the Son of God to their own harm, not to anybody else's, to theirs. And they're holding Jesus up to contempt. Now, now, brothers and sisters, this is what scares me about some of these people today that are preachers and Christian musicians and Christian artists, whatever that is, who say, I'm falling away from the faith. I've lost my faith. They're holding Jesus up to contempt. They're crucifying again the Son of God. These aren't people who, who are baby Christians. This is a scary passage that you have to get a hold of, brothers and sisters. And it gets a little scarier as we go on here. This is a scary passage that committed, mature Christians who have been enlightened, who have tasted of salvation, tasted, that's experienced for themselves. That, that word taste is a powerful word. You can't taste watching something. You, you taste by experience. You shared in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come into their life. They've tasted the goodness of the rhema of God. They've heard the Holy Spirit speaking to their spirit. They've seen God take scriptures and make it real to their lives. They've heard God's voice. And they've tasted of the miracles. And when they turn away, uh, it's impossible. There's, a, there's very few things in the Bible that are impossible. That's one of the lists that you should make. Make a list impossible things. Make a list of impossible things. That's an impossible. Run a word search on impossible. And now he tells you why. When you see why, for. He's telling you why. Why it is impossible. Okay. Why is it impossible? Four, the land. Now, remember, Paul teaches us that the land, the land would be a believer. Paul teaches the church in Corinth that the land is the believers, all right? The land that has drunk in the rain that often falls upon us. The rain is the Holy Spirit often falls upon it and produces a crop useful for those whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God, all right? A crop useful for those whose sake it was cultivated. This, this would be God. This would be the kingdom. Our life is being cultivated for the sake of the kingdom. Receives a blessing from God. I like that. So when the Holy Spirit falls upon our life, often falls upon our life, not once every 10 or 20 years, but the rain that often falls upon us, sitting right there in your house right now, the rain often falling upon you, produces a crop useful for those whom sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing of God. But, ah, here's that but. But if it bears thorns and thistles, but if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Now, in a Christian's life, yeah, it's, it's what's, what's laying there dormant in your life. If you are a Christian and the rain is falling upon you and there's no good seeds in you, remember what is the seed? The seed equals God's word. 
The gospel, remember, is the incorruptible seed. Now, if the only seeds in your life are bad seeds, okay? If, if when the Holy Spirit falls upon your life, all those beautiful seeds of the word are growing within your life, it, it's producing some beautiful things. But if the only thing in your life that lays there dormant waiting for the rain are the th seeds of thorns and thistles, then your life is worthless and near to being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Now, I think you need to begin to see what's happening up here with these believers. Okay. What, what is happening up here? All of this is highlighted here. These people have had incredible encounters with God, but there's no new seed in their life. The only thing in their life are the seeds of worthless things, thorns and thistles, bitterness, resentment, anger, hostility, jealousy, lust, all of those ugly things. And when the rain falls, these things begin to grow. And they said the Holy Spirit makes those things grow. When the rain falls, whatever seed is in your life grows. This is why you've often heard me say that revival is messy, all right? Holy Ghost revival is messy. And the reason it's so messy is whatever has been planted in people's life, as you come out of the desert and you come into the rain, everything grows. Now, it's not the Holy Spirit making lust grow. But those are the seeds that you planted within your life. And in an environment of the rain, everything that you have planted in your life begins to grow. Now, Paul here is speaking in agricultural terms, okay? He said, now, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, I like that, <laughs> in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Now, Paul said, I'm not worried about you with this. He said, I've just explained to you what happens to some believers who turn away. He said, but in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. I, I understand Paul saying that because, beloved, that's how I feel about you. I know that these things happen in people's lives. I know all of this stuff up here happens in people's lives. But, beloved, I feel sure of better things for you. <laughs> things that belong. Oh, I like that. Things that belong to salvation. Oh, there are things that belong to salvation. Those are the things that are growing and developing in your life. I like that. That's what, I, I don't like to focus on this first part. You have to deal with it. But, oh, I could preach a sermon on the things that belong to salvation. Paul said, I'm sure that these are the things that are growing in your life. So don't, don't fear this stuff up above. Don't fear that stuff, okay? You just stay close to Jesus and keep the seeds of the word planted in your life. Things that belong to salvation are growing in you. Aha, uh -huh, what's growing? I like that. One day I should preach a series on Hebrews. It's awesome. For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love you have showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. Please look at that. Oh, please look at that. That is one of the most encouraging passages in the Bible for leaders. Leaders, right now you have worked so hard calling the Connect Group members, Zooming them. Some of you are already beginning to hold Connect Groups, just especially among family and close friends that live right around you. You've worked so hard. Some of you pastors that are listening to me, you have worked so hard in this time. You, you've watched the other lazy preachers, but you haven't allowed that to influence you. You work so hard in these days. God is not so unjust <laughs> as to overlook your work. God has not overlooked your work. God has seen everything that you have done. God does not overlook the love that you have showed. All the love that you have showed. 
Some of you connect group leaders, you're up early in the morning, joining me for morning devotions and then calling the members. Some of you get up before I start morning devotions and you're already calling your connect group members to wake them up, to remind them to tune in. I mean, the love that you have showed, the work that you have showed for his sake. You haven't done this for me. You haven't done this for COP. You've done that for his sake. One of our members was talking to me last weekend, and they said, Pastor Summerall, you have worked so hard, and Sister Bev has worked so hard during this time, and you're a senior. And I said, no, nah, I'm just a junior. <laughs> I said, 64 is the new 26. And we laughed together because they're a senior also. And they said, Pastor, you've worked so hard, and you've done so much for the people. And Pastor, I heard that you didn't even take a salary the first three months during lockdown. I said, no, because the church didn't have money, and we were prioritizing other things. Take, trying to take care of the staff. I said, but you know what? I don't do this thing for money. For his sake. <laughs> for his sake. A pastor of another movement called me one day and he said, Pastor Summerall, would you come and, and preach for me? And I said, well, we can't travel. He said, when it's all over. I said, yeah. I said, let's, let's see. But I said, I can't make any promises right now because life is too unpredictable. I said, but you know, you have these people that are part of your movement. And yes, Pastor Summerall, but they want $20,000 to come preach in our church. And he said, Pastor Summerall, that would take a whole month of income. And he said, we're just small. We're just getting started. And he said, I heard that you preach for free. And you even pay your airfares for small churches. I said, yeah, I do. And then he said, why do you do that? He said, I was told that was foolish, that the Labor is worthy of his hire. And I said, we are. But there are things we do for his sake. Now, pastors, hear me. We don't do what we do for money. God has been good to us. And at this stage of my life, I'm blessed. I laugh sometimes and say, I'm one of those that got blessed last. But that's all right. God's promises, God has been faithful to his promises in my life. But you know what? We do what we do for his sake. And I, I could just sit here and elaborate on this forever. I was talking to a young person the other day. Their, their mother has been one of our top connect group leaders for more years than I can remember. And I thought, what an example. And this young person is called into the ministry now. What an example their mother has shown. What an example. She doesn't get paid for it. She doesn't get her living from it. She sacrifices to do it. She's doing it. For his sake. Now there's so many thousands of you that are just like that. Everything you do, you do for his sake. God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. All right. Now that has to be consistent. Okay. That's not a past tense. It's a continuous tense. All right. You you choose to live this way, and you keep living this way. Oh, I'm going so long in this, and we've only done 10 verses so far. Let me get going. Verse 11. And we desire, Paul said, all right, here, here is Paul's desire. Paul said, you want to know what I desire. We desire that each one of you, not just a few, each show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. You know, as you serve God, you're not worried about backsliding. So that, uh-oh, so that you may not become sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Oh, how do I stop on that one? That you may not be sluggish. You know, there are many Christians that get sluggish. Please forgive me. Think back, especially to the first three months of COVID, when we were locked in our houses. I was locked in this room. I remember leaving my apartment to go down, or leaving, yeah, apartment, leaving my condo to go down to start my car because it hasn't been started in a couple of weeks, and you need to run them. And told by the security guard, please return to your room, sir. I'm going, grabe, tell a guy. I feel like I'm 15 years old. Remember those first three months when we couldn't go anywhere? 
And do you remember when we started moving around again? Grabe, we were sluggish. We were stiff, diba? Inactivity makes you sluggish. Spiritual inactivity. Oh, get this. Spiritual inactivity creates sluggish. Sluggish spirit. Ah, spiritual inactivity creates or develops a sluggish spirit. Now, some of you, please forgive me. You wonder why spiritually you're so sluggish right now. You're not in a hurry to get back to church. You're not in a hurry to read your Bible. Everything is just kind of moving slow. You feel like one of those funny sloths that you see on National Geographic. You know, everything spiritually is moving real slow in your life because of your spiritual inactivity. You need to get up and get moving. A little bit of discipline, please. Get up, get your Bible out, read and pray. Get yourself to church and get there early in Jesus' name. Ah, start moving again. And the spiritual sluggishness goes away. He said, but I want you to be imitators. Now, here's another list that you need to start in your Bible. This is another list. What to imitate. This is something that you have to learn. What am I to imitate? Imitators of those. So imitators of people. Imitators of people. There are people that you can look at in life and, and say, all right, I want to imitate. You want to imitate their faith and you want to imitate their patience because they receive the promises. Ah, So look at these people. Look at their faith. Look at their patience. They're working, 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 working. Look at these people who, who, who show their work, their love. This is manifestations of faith. And they're believing God for the promises and they're working and they're serving. And through faith and patience, they receive the promises. This is beautiful stuff. He said, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and multiply you. And Abraham having patiently waited, obtain the promise. All right, folks, you need to get a hold of patience. 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 When you patiently wait, you obtain the promise. <laughs> uh, sometimes you look at people and go, you know what? Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes it takes a while to receive a promise of prosperity. Sometimes it takes a while to receive a promise of healing. Sometimes it takes a while to receive a promise of the salvation of your loved ones or your whole household. Sometimes it takes a while to receive a promise of a promotion. Having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So in God... Desire to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. Wow. The unchangeable character of his purpose. Not just his promise, his purpose. Ah, I, I got to be careful not to preach my way through this. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast the hope set before us. We have, oh, I got, this is mar marvelous stuff. We have the sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. So it is a sure anchor and it is a steadfast anchor. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. All right. If this is the holy place, and this is the Holy of Holies, all right? Let me put this up a little higher so you can see it. This is the holy place, and this is the Holy of Holies. And the Ark of the Covenant is in here. Paul said, listen, we have an anchor that has gone through here, the rope of that anchor, and that anchor is lodged right there. It is fixed. Now, this anchor has a rope on it. That rope may go over here, 
that rope may go over here, but that anchor never loses its hold in the Holy of Holies. Did you hear me? Your hope is anchored firm. Your confident expectation of future good. You, you may get pushed from one direction to another, but uh, the anchor is going to hold because that anchor is in the heavenly Holy of Holies. Where Jesus has gone as forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We talked about that the other day. In the heavenly holy of holies, your hope is anchored. Your hope, your confident expectation of future good is not anchored in the promise of a person or in the promise of a church. Your anchor is anchored in the heavenly holy of holies, in the presence of God, and that anchor will never turn loose, you have a great future ahead. All right, let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship. Testament portion today picks up Lamentations. Now, Lamentations was also written by Jeremiah. And lamentation simply means it's a lament. It's a sad song. All right. Chapter one, verse one. How lonely is the city that was full of people. Emphasis on the word was. How like a widow she has become. She who was great among the nations, she who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheek. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. 
All her friends have dealt treacherously with her, and they have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction and hard servitude. She dwells now among the nations, but she finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads of Zion, the roads to Zion mourn, for none come to the festival. All right, there's nobody going anymore to Jerusalem for the feasts. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her virgins have been afflicted, and she herself suffers bitterly. Her foes have become the head, her enemies prosper, because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. You see why this is called a lament? This is sad. For the daughter of Zion, all her majesty has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. Jerusalem remembers in the days of her affliction and wandering all the precious things that were hers of days of old. Wow, that's a hard thing to only have a memory. When her people fell into the hand of the foe and there was none to help her, her foes gloated over her and they mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem sinned grievously, therefore she became filthy. All who honored her despised her. For they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirts. They, she took no thought of her future. Therefore, her fall was terrible. Wow. Why people go bad? Why do people go bad? She took no thought of her future. Therefore, her fall was terrible. She has no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction for the enemy has triumphed. The enemy has stretched out his hand over all her precious things. Enemies always go after your precious things. For she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you have forbade to enter your congregation. All her people groan as they search for bread. They trade their treasures for food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, and see, for I am despised. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire into my bones and made it descend. He spread a net for my feet. He turned me back. He has left me stunned, faint for all the day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke, and by his hand they were fastened together. They were set upon my neck. They caused my strength to fail. The Lord gave me into the hands of those whom I cannot withstand. Now, now look at this. My transgressions were bound into a yoke. <sighs> Sin is a terrible burden. The Lord rejected all my mighty men in my midst. He summoned an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in the winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep. Yes, my eyes flow with tears, for a comforter is far from me, one to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, and there is no one to comfort her. The Lord has commanded against Jacob that his neighbors should be his foes. Jerusalem has become a filthy thing among them. Wow. The city of God has become a filthy thing. Words, there are no words. The Lord is in the right. Wow. For I have rebelled against his word. But hear all you peoples and see my suffering. My young women and my men have gone into captivity. I called to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perish in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Look, O Lord, for I am in distress. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me because I have become very rebellious. In the street, the sword bereaves. In the house, it is like death. Now, brothers and sisters, when you don't think about your future, when you rebel against his word, when you become very rebellious, this, this is the future. They heard my groaning, yet there was no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. God, they're glad you've punished me. <laughs> you have wrought the day you announced. Now let them be as I am. 
Let all their evil doing come before you and deal with them as you have dealt with me because of my transgression. Notice, because of my transgression. For my groans are many and my heart is faint. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool on the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob, and in his wrath he has broken down the strongholds of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around him. He has bent his bow like an enemy and his right hand set like a foe. And he has killed all who were delightful in our eyes in the tent of the daughter of Zion. He has poured out his fury like fire. The Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He has laid in ruins its strongholds, and he has multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He has laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The Lord has made Zion forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation he has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. He has delivered into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have raised a clamor in the house of God as that on the day of the festival. Now you begin to see why it's called the Book of Lamentations. It is the lament over the judgment brought about by decades and decades, generation after generation of sin and rebellion by the people of God. Never something that God wanted. And so when you see Jeremiah lamenting, remember, this is inspired by the Holy Ghost. It grieves God that all these things happened. Now, what a sad note to end on. <laughs> it's just, ah! Now you understand why I don't like songs that sound like laments, all right? <laughs> it's just, ah! Lament. A lament is about Punishment for sins. Yes, deserved, but I'd rather talk about the restoration of the joy of salvation. Okay, we're going to see it tonight as we get back into... No, we're not going to get into Romans tonight. Tonight, we've got the prayer service coming out of main campus. We'll see you then. <laughs>